for me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the Louis T. Network exclusive limited series, The Reign of Terror, chronicling the 23 years of pure hell. Daniel Snyder's put this fan base through. I, of course, am your set man, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. We are now on chapter 20, which brings us to the 2018 season. And a lot of changes, obviously. And, and it seemed like I say it seems like I said that about every single season. A lot of changes. And that's what happens when you're dealing with a tumultuous situation like Washington, a dysfunctional organization run by the worst owner in pro sports, a GM team president that is absolutely clueless and, and just as evil and sinister as the owner that he serves. It, it was just a bad time to be a fan of this team. Kirk Cousins now off to Minnesota. And you know, the, the sickening part about the Kirk Cousins saga is we would later find out, and some of you knew this already, but when we ended up trading for Alex Smith in this 2018 offseason, word came out that Washington could have had a first round. And, and you know, we knew this, I think, maybe the offseason before, that we could have had a first round pick from San Francisco. Kyle Shanahan desperately wanted Kirk Cousins and offered Washington a first-round pick for him, and we said no because they didn't want to trade Kirk to Kyle. They, they were being stubborn and ignorant and um, just not good business practice, allowing your personals to get in the way of business. And, you know, instead we get a third-round pick for him, a measly compensatory third-round pick instead of getting a first-round pick for him. Um, I mean, our, our organization is just comical, and, and it's laughable of all of the dysfunction that carried on here and, and, and things that stopped us from becoming a really quality football team or at least giving us the best chance to do so. And uh, that was just another instance in a long line of instances that proved that this organization simply was not running anywhere near max efficiency and, and had people at the top of the organization running it that weren't competent in nature. And so um, 18 featured you know obviously the first season since 2011 that no Kirk Cousins on the roster first since 2015 that he wasn't the unquestioned starter and so we were looking for a quarterback so you know similar to what we did back in 2000 and uh what was it 10 when Mike Shanahan first got here uh we traded for a veteran quarterback with Andy Reid <laughs> and this time instead of it being Donovan McNabb it was it was Alex Smith and uh you know Bruce Allen thought he was such a genius, you know. Whoa, Kirk's no longer here. We're gonna show them. We're gonna, we're gonna cut costs. We're gonna instead of paying Kirk all this money that he's not worth, we're gonna go out and pay Alex Smith all this money that he's probably not worth. Good job, Bruce. And you know, give up Kendall Fuller in the process, which pissed off a lot of us. If you remember, it wasn't the third round pick that made us pissed off because the, the Chiefs were moving forward with Patrick Mahomes. They didn't know at the time what they had, but uh, we certainly would find out very quickly as they were in the AFC Championship in his first year as a starter. However, um, we gave up a third round or so what? Okay, you got yourself a starting quarterback in Alex Smith. It was throwing in Kendall Fuller, who had emerged as one of the elite top nickel corners in the league, that pissed most of the fan base off. And Bruce thought he was, you know, doing this excellent job of getting us a quarterback, patting himself on the back, telling all of the staff members, you know, all the guys in the front office, turn your phones off. They had no idea what Bruce. Bruce went rogue on this deal, trading for Alex Smith. And um, Andy Reid, as he always did, laughed at us all the way, you know, to the draft, getting that third round pick and, and more importantly, getting Kendall Fuller, who would help him win uh, a Super Bowl in 2019. But that's nor here nor there. Uh, the bottom line was we had ourselves a quarterback. They tore up his old contract, which they didn't have to do, gave him new money. It sound familiar? They did the same shit with Donovan McNabb, right? Sound familiar with this dumbass group? And so, um, Alex Smith is here. And you're like, okay, he's not Kirk, but it'll have to do. And so, you, you have that change. The roster's constantly changing and, and turning over. I mean, listen to some of the names at receiver we had in 18. Trey Quinn. Robert Davis, Paul Richardson, if you remember, was one of the big offseason acquisitions that year um, at receiver. And so, I mean, these were the guys, Mo Harris, like this is the receiver group that we're trotting out there, right? Josh Doxson, and, and 
Like, it wasn't a great group to begin with, and then injuries took effect, and you're like, well, who the hell are we throwing the ball to? Um, you still had Jordan Reed, you still had Vernon Davis, you still had Chris Thompson, so there still were other options available aside from those receivers, but it wasn't a great group to get excited about, that's for sure. So, um, another big move that offseason was we were the only team in the NFL to put in a waiver claim for Reuben Foster when he was released by the 49ers, and um, that did not go well for Washington, and, and we weren't in a great state already as is. Bruce Allen thought he was being a genius again. Hey, we're going to take a shot on this kid. He's done nothing wrong. The rest of the league has already condemned him. Uh, we seem to have not gotten the memo. And so it was just another example of them just kind of not following the directions that were set out for them. Uh, but in any event, um, that's where we were as a franchise. Um, and we were still chasing the ghost of Junior Gallette. The last offseason, we had signed Gallette to a one-year deal. He got injured. We brought him back again. He got injured again. So we were chasing the ghost of Junior Gallette as well. And we spent a supplemental draft pick, something that Washington did. Jeremy Jarman, now Adonis Alexander, something that Washington did during this tenure over and over again and always striking out. So uh, they, they draft... Adonis Alexander in the supplemental draft. And so what did the regular draft look like? So this was Deron Payne, 18 draft. Uh, Darius Geis, 18 draft. Um, Josh Harvey Clemens is in this draft. Really wanted him to be good. Um, really thought he was going to end up being good. Um, hmm. Um... I was about to put Monte Nicholson. He was in the 17 draft. I was about to put him in this draft, but that wouldn't be accurate. Um, I feel like we drafted a corner. We had to have drafted a corner. After sending Kendall Fuller away, you had to draft a corner. Um, uh, I'm blanking again on this draft. Um, Deron Payne, Darius Geis, Josh Harvey Clemens. I'm going through the positions this time because I, I know I can get more than three guys out of this draft. Um, Sean Dion Hamilton. That's another one. Um, no defensive ends. Tim Settle. That was a big one. Can't forget Tim Settle. I feel good now. I got five guys, and I think I got the core of that draft. Deron, um, so, uh, we traded Sua Cravens that offseason, too. Because remember, he had left the team the year before, so he was a head case. So we got rid of him. Um, but Deron, Darius Geis, Sean Dion Hamilton. These were the later dudes, though. Tim Settle. Um, I think I already had said five dudes. Why am I missing one? Um, uh, this is the last time. We're going to move on. Okay. I got stumped on 17. I'm getting stumped again on 18. I can't believe it because I can remember older drafts better than I can these more recent drafts. Um, so, Deron Payne, Darius Geis. Josh Harvey Clements, that's who I had said. Sean Dion Hamilton, Tim Settle, and uh, do we did we draft any skill players other than Darius Geis? I don't think so. I really feel like we drafted a corner. And oh, Greg Stroman, that was the corner. I can't give you anything else. I got six. I'm gonna stop right there. Deron Payne, Darius Geis, Sean Dion Hamilton. Um, Josh Harvey Clemens, Tim Settle, Josh, uh, uh, Greg Scroman. I got nothing else for you. Uh, I might have left out a guy that was important, but that's all I have. <laughs> I got six. I feel really good about that. So um, that was your draft, essentially, going into the season. And um, you get to the first preseason game. I told you normally I don't talk about preseason unless something impactful happens. First preseason game against the New England, uh, New England Patriots, Darius Geis rips off a big run, 
tears his ACL on the play. We didn't know that at the time. Leaves the game. After the game, there's a, qu- a quick shot of him with a, a, a sucker in his mouth talking about, uh, I'm good. Don't worry about me. I'm good. <laughs> And I remember playing that clip for y'all and then finding out that this clown tore his ACL. And I'm thinking, that sucker in your mouth, you a sucker. And it 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 should have been a signal that this this dude wouldn't wrap too tight. And that don't get comfortable with him because he's gonna be gone here shortly. But um he was done for the season. So now what do you do? I mean, you were really counting on this kid to come in here and run the rock, because we really don't have anything at running back. And so we had to go call up the ageless wonder known as Adrian, Adrian Pertelson. And I, I, what, when I tell you what a joy it was to watch him run in 2018 at probably the age of 34 or something like that, I can't even imagine what it was like watching him in his prime in Minnesota. They were, they were probably being treated every single week because it was so much fun watching AD run in Washington in that season. He carried us to at least two or three victories and probably should have carried us to two or three more. He was so dynamic. As an aging back, they don't make him like him anymore. Anyway, um, he was huge in 2018. And so the cipher was complete. Alex Smith, Adrian Peterson, Paul Richardson. This was the new cast of characters that we were ushering in for the 2018 season. We go off to Arizona week one. And we dominate Sam Bradford in the Arizona Cardinals. I mean, we destroy them. And I remember thinking, wow, that was pretty damn impressive. And you know what else it was? Uneventful. Hmm. Who knew? The next week, we come home. You're thinking there's going to be this grand welcome. You come home from this road trip, destroying the Arizona, I mean, dismantling them. And we're playing the lowly Arizona, uh, Indianapolis Colts. So you're thinking to yourself, yeah, this thing's gonna be. This house is gonna be packed. They're gonna be crazy with AD and Alex Smith and half-empty stadium. And that was the first time it really set it set in. Like they're really sick of Dan and Bruce and this bullshit. There was nobody there. It was nobody there. And the people that were there were cheering for the Indianapolis Colts. And I, that was Darius Leonard's rookie season, and he kicked our ass. And I think he had like 18 tackles, forced a fumble, might have had an interception. He did some of everything in that game. And I, I remember this very vividly, though. This is the thing that, that stood out to me outside of the fans not being there the most. Is the Colts ran in that game twice a, a, a simple mesh concept. And we didn't communicate at all. And guys were wide-ass open. And after the game, all Greg Minuski wanted to talk about was communication. And that would be the theme of the season for him was communication, lack of communication, right? Wanted to slap Greg Minuski because at at some point, I ain't trying to hear that lack of communication shit. Figure it out. So that would be something that teams would figure out. Like they can't cover mesh, you know, routes. They get confused. They don't pass the shit off. If they're in man coverage, that guy gets picked off, whatever. You're going to have a receiver come wide open. So we lose to the Colts, and, and that's a disappointing you know, loss. But you bounce back the next week against Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. And, and like I've said to you guys over the years, Aaron Rodgers at FedEx Field in the regular season, we own him. I don't think he has a regular season victory over us in probably five or six tries. All right? He's only beaten us once at FedEx Field, but he beat us when it counted the most, and that was in the playoffs back in 2015. But outside of that, every regular season meeting, He's had at FedEx Field, we've gotten the best of him now. We can't beat him, and we've never beaten him at Lambeau, but he's never beaten us in FedEx Field. And this was another example. We beat the shit out of the Packers in this game. Now, they helped. They aided and abetted with mistakes, drop passes, a bunch of penalties. I thought, you know, there were a couple of hits from Clay Matthews in there that I didn't necessarily know if they were really flaggable offenses for, you know, um, roughing the passer, but I wasn't turning it down. Uh, but the the real story there was Alex Smith pushing the ball down the field, big play to uh, Paul Richardson. At that time, he was P. Rich, you know, when he was making plays. And don't forget, P. Rich early in that season, that Packers game, the Panthers game, the Saints game early, which is the game he got hurt in, he was making plays early in that season. Got hurt in that Saints Monday night game, and that was it for him. And he, really, that was it for him as – a member of this team in terms of real production we got down on him and he never stayed healthy but uh, nonetheless uh p rich was big in that game 
Um, we dominated the Packers and uh, beat them up pretty good. Um, so you go to get to two and one, and it's a surprising two and one. I'm not gonna lie to you; I wasn't expecting much. And so you go into your bye at two and one. You're feeling good. You come off the bye, and it's Drew Brees. You know this is what we've all called Brees porn night. It was Drew Brees porn night, if you recall. He was going to break the record for most touchdown passes in NFL history. It was this back and forth duel between he and Peyton Manning. Well, Peyton Manning had officially retired, so now it was all of, all his to, you know, kind of take ownership of. And he was going to break the record on, on Monday Night Football against Washington. And uh, all he needed was one touchdown pass to tie it, a second to break it. And um, that's all they talked about that entire night. But before we got to the, the porn portion of the night, we were in this football game. Saints score on the opening possession. We get a field goal uh, to counteract that. And then Ryan Kerrigan has a sack early in that game. And I remember being so pissed off. Because they're going to punt us the football. And, and we were moving the ball on their ass. And Monte Nicholson loses his cool, pushes a, 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 a offensive player after the sack over a pile so he falls down. So it's even more egregious. The official throws the flag, uh, unnecessary uh, roughness, uh, more unsportsmanlike conduct rather. And that set off a chain of events that led to an epic ass whooping okay that game was over after that we never rebounded they scored on that possession and it felt like every other possession after that for the next two quarters and a half and um we we got a sound thrashing that night and it, it turned quickly into drew Brees porn night and uh that that was a, a really really ugly contest one of my you know one of those games where i just i think i went live in the middle of the third quarter, it was so bad of that game, if I'm not mistaken. That game was still on, and I was live already. It was one of those types of uh, Monday night games. Really pissed me off. And that was, if you remember, that was the worst Monday night. It wasn't the worst Monday night group in history. I think you got Kornheiser and company um, that was really bad. Dennis Miller was terrible on Monday night. They tried some shit over the years. But it, it Booger McFarlane... Uh, Jason Witten and Joe Tessitore are really high on the list. That 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 booth is really high on the list of really bad Monday night groups, and uh, it got ugly that night. From the 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 broadcast booth on the field, it was just horrific. So you're two and two now. At least it only counts as one, right? So you come back after that, and you find a way to get it done. Um, in a really, really, what, what, matter of fact, who was after that game? I think we went on a stretch where we won three in a row. Carolina came to town, if I'm not mistaken. It was Carolina that came to town with Cam Newton. And um, we played well. Paul Richardson, huge game again. But the I think the biggest thing in that game was DJ Moore fumbled twice. He was a rookie. And he fumbled twice. Once on a punt, once on a... And Josh Norman, he forced the fumble and he got an interception. I remember that was his first interception in ages. Probably since his first year in Washington. Like, he did nothing in 2017 at all. Fans turned on him after loving him to death in 2016. Um... And he went off against his old team, forced a fumble, picked off uh, Newton on a pass, and um, we were able to just hold on. It, Cam Newton had our number. We could never beat Cam. I don't think we've ever beaten Cam Newton. Yes, we did. But this was a comeback Cam after he had left and came back. Um, we got him in 2021 when he came back, if you recall, when we went on that little four-game winning streak. Um, but before that, the, the first iteration, 1.0 Cam in, in Carolina, we, we never beat him. And it usually was an ass whooping over at Bank of America. But um, we got him at FedEx, and I think that was one of the first times we had beaten Cam at the time. That was a big one. And so now you're 3-2. and two. The next week, Dallas comes to town, and um, I'm not going to lie, I wasn't expecting to beat them. Um Dak had established himself. Zeke had established himself. 
Michael Gallup was starting to come into his own. That was his rookie season. Um, they were scoring points. They were doing the Dallas Cowboy thing, right? And uh, we had never beaten that up until that point. So it was a weird game. It starts off, Dak has a fumble on a fourth and one on a quarterback sneak. Um, I think DJ Swearinger kind of held him up and then stripped him of the ball. Um, that's the Kerrigan. That's the Preston Smith force fumble Kerrigan recovery. Or is it the other way around? Um, Kerrigan loops around. So it's the Kerrigan sack because Kerrigan loops around on like a late stunt inside. Sacks Dak, pops the ball free. Pa Preston Smith recovers it in the end zone. Um, shades of Daryl Grant, right? Um, and at that point, you think you're going to win the game. <laughs> you think you're going to win the game like that. That's going to put it away. And uh, I think that put us up 17 to, no, I think that put us up 20 to 10. And that should have been it, right? That should have been it. But typical Washington fashion, um, we let Dallas go down the field, score a touchdown, get the ball back. And they got a chance to tie the game up, send it to overtime. And in my mind, if they send this thing to overtime, we're going to lose this game. And they have an illegal snap, legal procedure there, backs them up five yards, and then they barely miss the kick. It hits the upright. No good, and we survived 20-17. to 17. Big win. Love that one. That was one of my ones that I loved that season because we hadn't beaten Dak yet. I had gotten tired of hearing he was undefeated against us. So that one, that one felt really good. Um... Then, the next week, it was a really sleepy game in the Meadowlands. Like, one of those games where you just, like, take a nap, you wake up, you're in the fourth quarter, and it's 13-6, to six and you're barely hanging on for dear life. And then Adrian Pertelson rips off a massive run um, down the sidelines, gets into the end zone when we're trying to burn clock to put the game away 20-6. to six. It was a, a defensive battle our defense dominated their offense uh, but our offense wasn't much better than theirs but we did just enough to win that game and adrian peterson was phenomenal which was a theme of the 2018 season and all of a sudden back-to-back -back wins in the nfc east three in a row you're five and two life is good um you drop one you know i, I think it ended up being like i forget against who but you drop one to five and three, if I'm not mistaken. That puts you at five and three. Then you beat Tampa. I just remember that game because the defense was horrendous, but Tampa turned it over and missed like 12 field goals. They had, uh, they had over 500 yards of total offense and only scored three points. I think they were the only team or one of the few teams in NFL history, if not the only team in NFL history, to ever compile and amass over 500 yards of total offense and only score three points. Um, that was Ryan uh, Fitzpatrick and company. And, um, boy, they were moving the ball up and down the field. Norman had a pick in that game. I remember um, somebody forced a bolo punch fumble in that game. I uh, can't remember who it was. I think it was Ryan Anderson that forced a bolo punch fumble of one of their backs that we recovered. And then they missed a bunch of field goals. So won that game 16-3. to Puts us at 6-3. and You're feeling really good. And then everything changed in that game against the Texans in week 11. So we all know what happened. Um, it wasn't going well for us. Alex Smith had already thrown a pick six in the game. Right down by the end zone. We were going in to take the lead. He throws a pick six. Uh, returned the other way. I want to say it was Justin Reed who picked him off. Who was probably a rookie at the time. Um, and goes in for the touchdown. And um, Alex Smith in the third quarter of that game... Um, on you know pressure from two Texans, most notably J.J. Watt, knee just leg just snaps under the pressure and the weight of those defenders, and we didn't know how severe it was at the time. We just know Alex was snapping on the ground and he was in clear pain. 
I'm thinking, okay, he probably tore his ACL or blew his Achilles out or something like that. We've seen guys do that on the field. You know, worst case scenario, he broke his ankle or something, you know. But then you see him sitting on the ground, writhing in pain, and you see his, where you know, that lower leg area where the shin is, but off to the side, the bone is sticking out like this. And you're like, whoa, 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 what the hell is that? That's not his bone, is it? And at that point, you're like, this shit is serious. And uh, we would, you know, later learn how serious, 17 surgeries later, you know, um, he's able to walk and function. And we know the whole story. We'll talk more about that when we get to 2020. But um, clearly he's out for the remainder of the game and the season. Um, <clears throat> in comes Colt McCoy. Obviously, that's Jay's guy. So the season's not done yet. At least we think, um, but we don't win that game, um, and, and that was a tough one to swallow because I thought that was a very winnable game. But uh, nonetheless, um, the following week is Thanksgiving against Dallas, um, and I remember that entire week I was hyping up Colt McCoy. <laughs> I even had the audacity to call him Goat McCoy. Uh, I did not want to let this season dive. We hadn't started 6-3 and three in forever, probably since like 08 when the Steelers came to town and embarrassed us on a Monday night. I didn't want to let the season die yet. So rally behind old 12, right? Goat McCoy. Uh, he put up a hell of a fight for about three quarters and, the, and then it just imploded in the fourth quarter. Back-to-back -back turnovers on, you know, one of them was a pick six by Demarcus Lawrence. And, uh, yeah, it got out of hand real quick on Colt. Um, and, and so we lose that football game. But we hung in there tough. I was proud of him. So it gave me hope for the Monday night game the following week at Philadelphia that uh, we'd be able to bounce back. If Colt played that way minus the turnovers, I thought we could beat Philadelphia. And um, that didn't last but maybe a quarter. I don't even know if it lasted that long. I think it was the opening possession or the second possession of the game. He breaks his ankle. Typical Colt McCoy shit. Gets an opportunity, can't stay healthy to save his life. And once he got hurt, the season was over. Adrian Peterson had like a 93-yard run that gave us a 10-7 to lead early in the second quarter. And I'm thinking, we got dirty Chez in this ball game. On a Monday night, he just got here, like five days ago maybe, and we they don't, we can't throw the football. They know it. All they have to do is stop Adrian Peterson, and yet he just ripped off a 95-yard run or whatever, and, and we're up 10-7. to seven. Obviously short-lived. It's Carson Wentz. He was still digging on our ass at that time, making Houdini-like plays. He did it again that night. And ultimately, we lose to the Eagles. And we were leading the NFC East when Alex Smith went down. Three losses later, you're 6-6. Six and six, And this season is quickly falling apart at the seams. Injuries are starting to catch up with us at multiple positions. Brandon Sheriff is out. Trent Williams is out. You see where this is going, right? It's the same thing as 2017. You're finishing the season up with guys that you don't know this guy. He wasn't here when the season started. Who is this guy? Um, it just got progressively worse. Paul Richardson was out for the season. Jordan Reed was out. Um, again, Dirty Chez starts the following week. I remember him having this impressive press conference. People falling in love with him. We play the Giants. It's 36 to nothing, and he's thrown two pick sixes in the first half. That was the game where I, 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 I stopped watching the game, went live at halftime, and demanded that everyone be fired now. Bruce Allen, Jay Gruden, I want them all gone now. And you know, that's not me. I don't react that way, but I had seen enough. Get rid of everybody. If Dan can go, start with his ass. But we knew he wasn't going anywhere at the time. He's gone. So that was an abject disaster. One of the most embarrassing games um, of, the, of the Gruden tenure. Um, and so 
they insert Josh Johnson in the second half of that game, and he actually breathed life in, late into the season. Um, we weren't dead yet. Uh, we get an improbable win on the road at Jacksonville that kept us alive. And then, you know, we had a Saturday game against the Titans late in the season. And, boy, I'll never forgive. And he's a golden domer, so as much as I want to find it in my heart to forgive, I will never forgive Michael Floyd for dropping a touchdown pass late in that Titans game that would have given us the lead and ultimately would have probably been the game-winning score. Josh Johnson, first of all, I thought this was the best coaching job of Jay Gruden's career. He had nothing at receiver. I'm telling you that Michael Floyd was one of the primary receivers late in the season. Like, I've already told you Paul Richardson is injured. I told you what we went into the season with. Trey, Trey Quinn was another guy that was drafted that year. And I think I missed him earlier, but Trey Quinn was drafted that year, Mr. Irrelevant, as a matter of fact, the final pick of that draft. Jay loved him. He was injured. Robert, um, um, Robert, I don't know why I'm blanking on his name, and his cousin played in the league. Uh, Robert Thomas, no, Davis, Robert Davis was out for the season. Paul Richardson was out for the season. So we got Michael Floyd on the roster now. And Jay coached his ass off. He put together a great game plan for Josh Johnson, who went out there and played one hell of a game. I gained a newfound respect for him that, that game. And Adrian Peterson ran for over 100 yards. He was trying to carry us. And all Michael Floyd had to do was catch that pass and score. And he would have if he would have caught it. And we would have won that game. Instead, he drops it, we settle for a field goal, and the Titans ended up going down the field um, and only needing a field goal, and they get the field goal. Had we scored the touchdown, they would have needed a touchdown. I don't think they were scoring a touchdown the rest of that game. That was a heartbreaker, uh, and that effectively ended the season. Um, it was uh, really disappointing, but... It was, that, that was just a bad season anyway. Once Alex Smith got injured, you, you knew the season was done. I, I wasn't giving on, up on it with Colt. Once Colt broke his ankle, definitely over now. So 18 was frustrating, but that's where we were. You know, that's where we were. And you could see 19 coming a mile away because of how bad the roster had deteriorated by the time we had gotten to 18, there's no Kirk to save you now. As much shit as everyone likes to talk about Kirk, he he made lemonade. Sometimes, maybe it was a little acidic, but he made lemonade out of lemons that weren't always fresh. Rarely were they fresh. Definitely after 16, when you lose Pierre and Deshaun, they weren't fresh lemons anymore. And now we didn't have anybody to make lemonade. So... Now what? You traded for Alex Smith? He's not playing football anymore. His career's done. Now what? You could see 19 coming a mile away. And boy, was it bad. And that's where I'm going to leave you on the reign of terror. Chronicling the 23 years of pure hell Daniel Snyder has put this fan base through. I'm your man, Louis T. Signing off. Until next time, you guys have a good one. Take care. Oh, see.